Good morning, Crosspoint Church. We're so glad that you're here. Won't you stand to your feet? Let's get ready to worship Jesus. Let's put our hands together. Come on. We're here to give him praise. Come on, we sing. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Come on, come on. I was breathing, but not. All my failures I tried to hide It was my doom Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that pastors here and and we baptize people after they've trusted Jesus to forgive their sin and come into their lives and to be their savior and king and this is Sawyer he has done that and one thing I love about Sawyer is he he is always willing to help in church he loves to raise money for missions and his mom has sent me photos of him reading his bible every day 
and I love it. I love it. So here he is. And let me just say, when a kid loves to read his Bible and a kid loves missions, that's more on the parents than on us here at the church. He's got great parents. They're doing the right things at home. So thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. Hey, Sawyer, have you given your life to Jesus? Yes. Have you trusted him to forgive your sin and to be your Savior? Yes. You want to live for him the rest of your life? Yes. All right. Because of your testimony, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You stand to your feet. Let's continue to worship Jesus this morning. Thank you, Lord. There isn't time enough to see. 
Come on, can we sing that chorus again? With a thousand Can we give Jesus praise? He deserves it all. He deserves our best praise. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In a moment, we're gonna take communion together. And this is what we believe here at Cross Point Church, is that as we take communion, it's the one thing that unites us all as believers of Christ. And so we don't ask that you be a member of Cross Point Church to take communion this morning. In fact, we don't ask you to be a member of any church to partake in communion. We just simply ask that you believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and that the Father raised him from the dead. And second thing is this, is that as we take communion, communion it should cause us to never forget what Jesus has done on the cross for us. For the free gift of life that we have in Jesus, because of what he's done for us. And lastly, it should cause us to look inward, to see the things that we do that are offensive to God. And it should cause us to invite the Holy Spirit to help us to become more and more like Jesus. And so if that's you today, you wanna take communion, that's great, that's awesome, do it. If you don't have any elements in your hand, just simply lift up your hand and some of the hosts in the back can get some elements to you. And for those of you who are watching online, welcome. We're so glad you're tuning in. Why don't you take this time right now, go into the kitchen, grab some juice, some water, some crackers, some bread, whatever you may have, so that you too can partake in communion with us. Church, we're gonna sing another song. It's called Son of Suffering. I can't think of a better song right now that as we reflect on Jesus and what he's done for us, and as we take communion, this song just speaks to that. And so we're gonna worship Jesus with this song, and then afterwards, Pastor Dan's gonna come out and he's gonna give us some instructions on how to take communion. Come on, let's continue to worship him this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
such an amazing God. Right now, my heart is just so filled with gratitude. Communion isn't just a moment that we stop just to do something. It's a moment for us to stop and be reminded of what our Heavenly Father has done for us. To not take it for granted, not take it lightly, but have a heart of humility of saying, God, thank you. It's not about me. It's not about the things that I can do. It's all about you. And so in this moment, as we get ready to partake, let's just stop. 
And let's align our hearts with him, with a grateful heart. I'm gonna read some scriptures and then I'm gonna talk briefly and then I'm gonna pray and then we'll partake together. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you, for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. He stepped in for the price that we deserved. And so in a moment, I'm gonna pray, and I just encourage you to just give God thanks in your own words as I pray. Because he stepped in and he did everything. There's nothing that we can do, but he did everything. So let's give God everything in this moment. Let's pray, dear Heavenly Father. God, we thank you for your love. God, we're so thankful that you stepped in and you paid a price that we deserved. God, our hearts are filled with gratitude. God, may we never forget. May we constantly take moments to stop and realign our hearts with you, Lord. God, we love you and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake of the bread together. Again, in 1 Corinthians, it says, as we continue, it says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Again, we're reminded as we look at the cup that there's a new covenant. The old covenant's gone. The new covenant is here that Jesus paid that price so that we could be in eternity with God. That he paid that price to be reminded of that, but that we could be in relationship with him. That he longs to be with us. To think about that for a moment. Our heavenly father wants to be in relationship with us. And so as we pray, let's just be reminded of the new covenant. Be reminded of how much our heavenly father longs to be with us. Let's give him thanks. Let's pray, dear heavenly father, God. Thank you for the love that you have for all of us. God, in this moment, as we are reminded of what you did for us, be reminded how much you care for us, the love that you have, and that you long to be in relationship with us. So God, we give you thanks that you paid the price that we deserved. We're so thankful for the new covenant and the love that you have for us, that you stepped in so we can spend eternity with you. We love you, and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's partake of the juice together. Praise God. Praise God. Feel free to take the cup elements. You can put them underneath your seat. The host will stop by after service, and they will pick those up. We are so thrilled that you have joined us here this moment, this morning. All right, now would be a great time to turn and uh, just greet those around you. Glad you're here this morning. Continue to worship the Lord through our regular Sunday morning tithes and Kingdom Builders offerings. I want to say thank you so much for your faithfulness to tithe and for your generosity.
Kingdom Builders. A few weeks ago, we handed out these booklets called The Heartbeat of God. It's our Kingdom Builders booklet with all of the projects that we hope to fund in 2024. If you missed it, there are some copies back at the back. A host can get one for you. But you can also scan the QR code in the seat in front of you and go to the website and see a digital copy of that as well. There are multiple ways that we can give today. At each exit is a lockbox that you can drop your check or cash into. You can give online at crosspointwaverly.com. You can text the amount to the number on the screen or you can mail or drop off your check or cash here at our office anytime Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to five. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you so much for your presence and power in this service this morning, uh, for the corporate worshiping together that's taken place already. And now even in this moment, as we get to bring our tithes and give generously to Kingdom Builders, we pray that you would bless each person who gives and bless the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, let's turn our attention to the screen for a few announcements. Well, good morning, Cross Point Church. We're so glad that you've come to worship with us today. Hey, if you're new here for the very first time, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And we'd like to get to know who you are. And so in the seat back in front of you is a QR code. Scan that QR code, fill out the digital connect card, and then after service, come to the Welcome Center. We'd like to know who you are, answer any questions that you may have about our church, and give you a free gift. And for those of you who are watching online, welcome. We're so glad you're tuning in. If you are new online, want you go ahead and click on the digital connect card. Fill that out so then that way we get to know who you are. And so then that way we get to serve you and your family. We're so glad you're tuning in. We've got some exciting things coming up and we want you to know these things. First thing is growth track. That's going to be taking place on February 20th. Food is provided, child care is provided. This is a time when you get to learn about our church and learn about the giftings that God has given you. So don't miss out on this opportunity. Hey, we've got the IF gathering that's gonna be taking place for our sisterhood, ladies of our church. This is a live streaming event. And so if you want some more information about that, want you check out your bulletin or call the church office. We'd love to answer any questions that you may have. Hey, we've got small groups that have already kicked off but it's not too late for those of you who want to join a small group. So if that's you, once you scan that QR code and join a small group. We've got Grief Share. This is a 13 week seminar. And if you know of somebody that's dealing with the loss of a loved one, or if that's you, once you get involved with this community. And lastly, we've got Fine Arts that's gonna be taking place here at our church. This is for our students. So if that's you and you wanna showcase the giftings and the talents that God has given you, sign up for this event. Hey, this is all I have for you and I hope that you have a blessed day. God bless you. Thanks so much, Pastor Levinsky. As I say each week, so many great things happening. Hopefully you'll take advantage of, of all of them. We're so glad that you're here today. Today we are beginning a new sermon series called Better Relationships. This coming Wednesday is Valentine's Day. So for those of you who are in a romantic relationship and you've not been outside in the last three weeks, this is your warning that Wednesday is Valentine's Day. On Friday, I needed to pick up something from Walmart and I walked in and if I was unaware that Valentine's Day was coming up, I was immediately made aware for all of the heart-shaped everything for aisles up in, in Walmart this week. But for those of you who are not in a romantic relationship, I would beg that you're not too me out quite yet. Uh, in this series, we're going to talk about things that I believe will impact our relationships in general. More specifically, we're going to talk about three words that should be part of our daily vocabulary. Last semester, I had the joy of one Wednesday night being in the kindergarten classroom, and I was selected to be at the table with, uh, for the coloring pages and for the snacks. And so, yeah, I mean, you can clap and cheer for that. It was an amazing experience for me. And I'll tell you, it was very enlightening. Uh, your children are amazing and they're hilarious. And so I'm sitting there at the table and we're coloring sheets together and we're handing out snacks. And one little boy looks over at me after he has completed eating one package of fruit snacks. And who doesn't love fruit snacks? I mean, we don't even have little kids in our house anymore and we still have a giant box of fruit snacks. So this kid looks at me and he says, can I have another package of fruit snacks? And somebody had taught this little boy manners. 
Somebody must have read to him Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Because he followed that request with this magic word. Anybody want to guess what the magic word was? That's right. You know what happened? That kid got a second package of fruit snacks. You know, I did a slide too. Like I hit it underneath my hand and just kind of slid it over there to him. We didn't advertise to the whole table that everybody was getting two packages. Please is the magic word in relationships. This morning, we're starting a brand new series called Better Relationships, and you and I were designed to live in life-giving relationships because we were created in the image of God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. As Christians, we believe there's one God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even before the creation of men and women, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit existed in eternal, satisfying, fulfilling relationship. God did not create us because he was lonely and needed us. God made us so that he could love us. And God made us so that we could experience life-giving relationships like he experiences in the Trinity. Jesus echoed this idea when, he was, uh, when the Pharisees sought to interrogate him by asking this question. They said, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus' answer, again, illustrated the primary importance of relationships. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you so much for your word, for the power that it has to transform our lives. We ask that over the next few moments that we would sense a demonstration of your spirit's power. Would you make your word come alive to us? We pray, open up our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our minds to understand what you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Christianity can be summed up of what it's all about with two phrases, love God and love people. Love God and love people. Everything else hangs on these two ideals of love God and love your neighbor. Why doesn't Joseph go to bed with Potiphar's wife? Because he loves God and he loves Potiphar. Why does Paul endure shipwrecks and beatings and persecution and snake bites? Because he loves God and people. Why do we do what it takes to build better relationships with God and our friends and our family and even our enemies because we love God and love people? Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse number 10, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life happens in the context of relationship with God and others. We talk frequently of why we exist as a church. We exist as a church to inspire and equip people to give their whole lives to God, to grow in their relationship with him and others and go tell the world the good news. Abundant life happens in the context of relationship with God and others. The currency of abundant life is not money. The currency of abundant life is relationships. You can pack up, you can rack up accomplishments and pile up money and build up a reputation, but you'll never have abundant life without better relationships. Abundant life happens when we enjoy relationships where we love and are loved, where we serve and are served, where we forgive and are forgiven, where we celebrate and are celebrated, and where we encourage and are encouraged. I I tell you, I want better relationships. I want a better relationship with God. I want a better relationship with my wife and with my kids and with my friends and my coworkers and my neighbors. I even want a better relationship with my enemies because I want to experience all that God has for me. How about you? In the next few weeks, we're going to discover three small words that have the power to transform our relationships. And these three words are please, sorry, thanks. Please say those after me. Please, sorry, thanks. Thanks. One more time. Please. Sorry. Thanks. Nothing opens doors like please. Nothing mends fences like sorry. And nothing builds bridges like thanks. 
If you wanna go deeper in those three words, I'd encourage you to read the book by Mark Batterson called Please Sorry, Thanks. And this is where some of the thoughts that we're talking about this morning are coming from. Today I wanna to talk to you about the first of those three words. It's the magic word that we've already talked about. And again, what's the magic word? This morning I want us to think about the power of please and how it can transform our relationships. The power of please opens doors. The power of please connects hearts. The power of please builds relationships of honor and the power of please makes the impossible possible. If you have your Bibles today, if you would turn to Philippians chapter two, we're gonna begin reading in verse number one this morning, Philippians chapter two. In this passage, Paul lays out four incredible principles behind the power of please. Philippians chapter two, verse number one, it's also going to appear on the screen. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is power in please, and in this passage, we find four principles that can help us build better relationships as we employ the power of please in our lives. The first principle is this, the power of please grows in the soil of humility. The power of please grows in the soil of humility. Let's look again at Philippians chapter two, verse number three. Paul writes, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Again, the power of please grows in the soil of humility. Here's an incredible way of understanding the word humility. C.S. Lewis said it this way, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking, of your, thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. So humility doesn't reject the idea that you have been created by God in his image. It doesn't reject the idea that your life matters or that you have gifts and talents and abilities. Humility isn't some kind of false projection that you are less than what God made you. In other words, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Instead, it's thinking of yourself less. And that's what Paul says in this verse, the power of please grows in the fertile soil of humility. But he goes on to write that it's choked out by the weeds of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Selfish ambition fuels us to build a life all about me, my goals, my future, my dreams, my passions, my desires, my wealth, my plans. Selfish ambition is about building my kingdom and launching my legacy and increasing my name recognition. Selfish ambition is all about using others to get the things that I want. And selfish ambition has a wicked twin, which is vain conceit. And Paul says that the reason selfish ambition builds a life all about me is that vain conceit convinces me that life is all about me. Vain conceit convinces us that time began the moment that we were born. Only then did the clocks of the universe begin to turn and the, and the pages of the calendar start turning. Vain conceit is the arrogance that causes us to believe the story of the world is the story of my life. It's like I think this story began on page one when I was born. I'm the protagonist of the book and the star of the movie, but that's not the case. We're just part of the story. 
This is God's story, and it's millions of years before I was born and outside of space and time. I don't know when, when I came in, but I know I didn't come in on page one, and, and at least somewhere 739-something thousand pages into the story because that's when uh, Jesus was born, and he's the real start of the story. This pastor and author Rick Warren wrote in The Purpose Driven Life, it's, this book has been translated in, in more languages than any other book besides the Bible, and he begins this book with four words. It's not about me. It's not about me. Excuse me, it's not about you. I guess if I'm going to quote somebody, I should quote it right. It's not about you. It's not about you. Selfish ambition and vain conceit are the barren soil that give birth to an attitude of arrogance that prevents the power of pleas from growing in our lives. And here's what James wrote about pride and arrogance in James chapter 4, verse number 6. He says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humility, not selfish ambition, not vain conceit, but humility is the soil that the power of please grows in. And it's the power of please that helps us build the better relationships that we want. Here's the counterintuitive reality found in James chapter 4, verse number 10. It says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. The second principle that we see in this passage is the power of please sees beyond ourselves. The power of please sees beyond ourselves. Let's look back at Philippians chapter 2 and this time look at the end of verse number 3 as it connects to verse number 4. Paul writes, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest but also to the interest of others. Humility is the soil that the power of please grows in and the fruit that comes from it is a life that doesn't just look out for my own interest but causes me to look out for the interest of those around me. The power of please sees beyond me and recognizes that life is not a solo sport. David didn't become Israel's greatest king on his own. His 37 mighty men helped place him on the throne. Paul didn't take the gospel all across the Near East on his own. He was helped by 29 people who are mentioned by name in Romans chapter 16 and by countless nameless others who helped him on his missionary journeys. Even Jesus didn't try to do life alone. He did life and ministry with, in, in close proximity to 12 disciples. There was a group of women who worked to fund his ministry and 70 or so others that he equipped and sent out for ministry. Here's what I've learned in the 20 plus years of ministry and growing a family and trying to make a difference in people's lives is this, that one is too small of a number for greatness. One is too small of a number for greatness. I can't build a great life alone. I can't live life to the fullest alone. I need relationships. I need my wife. I need my kids. I need my friends. I need my colleagues. I need my brothers and sisters. And here's the counterintuitive reality if we want to build a great life. If we want to experience all that God has for us, we've got to think less about ourselves. We've got to not just look out for ourselves, but invest in the lives of people around us. And that's what Paul says, the power of please looks not just for my interest, but for the interest of the people around us. And here's what's amazing about looking out for others and not just for ourselves about living to give and not just what we can get. It's what author and pastor Mark Batterson calls the rule of reciprocity. It flows from what we've, we've referred to as the golden rule, which is found in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. When we practice the power of please, when we check our ego at the door, when we assume the best instead of thinking the worst, when we give people the benefit of the doubt rather than doubting that they have any benefit, when we're generous towards others with our thoughts and with forgiveness and with our finances and our time and our abilities, here's the crazy thing, we wind up with more than what we give. So look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse number 38. Luke chapter 6, verse number 38, Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. 
good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. The power of please grows in the soil of humility. The power of please sees beyond ourselves. Third, the power of please is counterintuitive and countercultural. The power of please is counterintuitive and countercultural. We live in an entitled culture. Entitlement and arrogance go hand in hand. And I just wonder, like, for each of us this morning, if we were to do an audit of our text messages or our emails over the last month and we were to just search the word please, how many times would that appear in our written communications with one another? If we were to think back to the conversations that we've had with our kids and with our spouses and with our friends and coworkers and teammates, how often does this word please come up in conversation? For us to build better relationships, the power of please has to be put into practice. As we think about arrogance and entitlement, arrogance says, demand your rights. Please says, lay them down. Arrogance says, hold the grudge. Please says, forgive. Arrogance says, me. Please says, we. Arrogance says, mine. Please says, ours. Arrogance says, wash your hands of them like Pilate, but please says, wash their feet like Jesus. Arrogance says, my way or the highway, please finds common ground. Arrogance divides, please reconciles. Arrogance discourages, please encourages. Arrogance hurts, please helps. Arrogance says, please is weak. Please says, in my weakness, he makes me strong. The power of please is the counterintuitive path to better relationships. There's a story of a kid named Benjamin who at Christmas time wanted a baby sister for Christmas. So he decided that he would write a letter to God and in that letter to God, he wrote, God, I have been a very good boy this year. Realizing that was a lie, he scratched through it and he tried again. God, I've been a pretty good boy this year. Realizing that that too was untrue, he wadded up the piece of paper, he threw it in the garbage and decided that he would try a different tactic. He walked over to the nativity set that was underneath the Christmas tree and he grabbed the figurine of Mary and he hid it under his bed and he began to write, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again, We laugh at how naive this kid is, but we do the same thing. We aren't that overt, but we employ the same tactics of bribery and blackmail. Dear God, if you do this, then I will do that. Dear God, if you don't do this, then I won't do that. And if we're not careful, then our entitlement and arrogant mentalities will slip into our relationship with the creator and the Lord of the universe. The power of please is the counterintuitive path to better relationships. And because of the entitled and arrogant culture we live in, politeness feels like an endangered species. But the good news is, is that the lands, in that landscape, it makes your pleas all the more powerful. It makes your pleas all the more powerful. I guarantee you that this week, you're gonna be listening for the word please. And I hope more importantly, that each of us will employ the word please more than we're even listening for it. The word please is powerful in our relationships with our friends and families and classmates and teammates, coaches, bosses, coworkers, and with God. The power of please grows in the soil of humility. The power of please sees beyond ourselves. The power of please is counterintuitive and countercultural. And finally, the power of please reflects the mindset of Jesus. The power of please reflects the mindset of Jesus. Let's look again at Philippians chapter two, verse number five. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, 
so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul tells us that in our relationships with each other, we need to have the mindset of Jesus. And what is that mindset? Again, we can see it in verse number six, that Jesus was God, but he didn't consider being God something to use for his own advantage. Philippians says Jesus didn't use it for his own advantage. Instead, he made himself nothing. Another translation says it this way, that he emptied himself and became a servant. Not king, not a human servant, not an angelic servant, a human servant who died. Not a human servant with immortality restored, a human servant who died on a cross. Not a human servant who died a natural death after a long life, but a human servant who died the most grisly death. This is Jesus. And look what happened to him. He shoved selfish ambition and vain conceit to the side. He looked out for others instead of himself and look where it got him. Drained of immortality, shrouded with humanity, cursed by those he created, crucified as a common criminal, buried in somebody else's tomb because he couldn't afford his own tomb. It's not a very good track record for the power of please. But the story doesn't end there. As we continue to look at Paul's words in Philippians chapter two, God reached into the tomb. He breathed life into the broken, beaten body of Jesus. He raised him from the dead and he didn't seat him in heaven's balcony or on the front row, but he exalted him to the highest place. He gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord for the glory of God. This is the model that Jesus has set before us. That one word could help shape better relationships with each other and better relationships with him. I'm gonna ask that you would bow your heads and close your eyes all across this room. Maybe there are some of you who've come in today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You've never asked him to be your Lord and Savior. You say, today I wanna become a follower of him. Did you hear about the price that Jesus paid on the cross for you as we remembered his sacrifice and communion? And even in these verses this morning, we see the love that the Father had for us, that he would send his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, that we could have forgiveness of sin. Maybe there are others of you who at one time walked with God, but you've turned your back on him and you say, today, I need to see my relationship restored back to him just a moment with every head bowed and every eye closed if that's you you say I need to ask Jesus to come into my life for the very first time or you say I need to see my relationship restored back to him when I count to three why don't you slip up your hands all across this room one two three lift them up all across this room thank you one two three four you can put them down are there others five are there others this morning six you can put it down are there others Let's all stand. There were at least six hands that went up this morning of people who need to ask Jesus to come into their life for the very first time or who need to see their relationship restored back to him. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer. And if you raise your hand, I want you to repeat it after me and mean it with everything that's within you. But know that you won't be praying this prayer alone, but that each of us in support of you will also be praying. Let's pray. Say, dear heavenly father, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I've messed up. This morning I ask for your forgiveness. Come and give me a fresh start. Be my savior, be my king. Take over every area, take over every aspect and help me from this day forward to live for you with all of my heart with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God praise for what he's done this morning.
if you raised your hand and prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask that you would do a couple of things. One is that you would look to the person on your left or right and tell them of the decision that you've made today so that they can encourage you. The second thing is in just a moment, the prayer team's gonna make their way to both sides of the stage and we leave time at the end of each of our services for people to receive prayer. If you raised your hand and you prayed that prayer, I would encourage you that as soon as the worship team begins to sing, that you would step out of your seat and let the person know up here the decision that you've made so that they can pray for you and pray a prayer of blessing and encourage you in this journey. So I'm gonna pray. Worship team's gonna lead us in another song. Prayer team's gonna make their way to both sides of the stage. And again, if you've come here today needing prayer for anything, I'd encourage you to step out of your seat and come forward. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, even a, a simple reminder today of these three words of please and sorry and thanks. God, would you help us to to live different than culture. Would this word please be at the tip of our tongue in, in so many of our conversations? And Lord, may it help shape the relationships that we have and may it make our relationships better. God, we're so grateful for the example that you've given to us in Jesus. And the words that we find in this incredible book. And so God, we ask that in this day and this week, and for the rest of our lives that you would help us to put your words into practice. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name.
so much for worshiping with us this morning. We'll see you next week at either 8.30 or 10.15. Have a blessed week. Too good to let me go